Welcome. My name is Patrick Curran, and along with my buddy Dan Bauer, we make up CenterStat, and we offer a whole tassel of online teaching with workshops across a whole variety of topics, and nearly all of them, in one way or another, involve matrices, matrix algebra, matrix manipulation, expressions, and what we thought we'd do is spend a little bit of time with you just reviewing basic components of matrices, what they are, what is terminology, how do we add and subtract them. And if you haven't been exposed to this before, maybe it'll give you something to put in your back pocket when you move on to other training opportunities. Yeah, and we're not, our goal is not to turn you into an expert at matrix algebra, but because so many models and, um, you know, even software are set up with matrix expressions, it can be helpful just to have a little bit of basic familiarity with these in order to kind of navigate, um, you know, textbooks and manuscripts and user manuals and software input and all that kind of stuff. And just to show off at cocktail parties. I mean, how many times have you been at a party and somebody has said, well, you can divide two matrices and you want to swirl your wine and say, actually, matrix division is not defined. You must multiply by an inverse. And so we're going to teach you how to be intolerably self-righteous by pointing out that you can't divide two matrices. You have to multiply by an inverse. Spoiler alert. Oh, wait, that's supposed to come before. <laughs> oh, wait, that's four. it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Actually, that's all we need. Thanks all right, for we're joining good. us. <laughs> we're good. Um, all right. So we're going to go over some slides. I'm going to queue them up now. Bauer is going to tap out. And I'm going to talk with you for a bit, and then Dan will loop back in, mostly when I start making mistakes and he needs to take over and correct anything that I have said. Slide so two. What about slide two? I was going to say you can't. <laughs> yeah, oh boy. We spend a little bit too much time together, I think. Quite um, clearly. Quite clearly. So um, these slides are also available as a PDF that's online. So wherever you access this video, there's also a link there where you can download these with uh, the actual slides within a PDF format. So let's get to work. Bauer, get out of here. Let, let me do an honest day's labor here. Let's see you in a bit. Slide okay. two. Slide two. <laughs> yeah, please don't, please don't stop me at least right on the title slide. So um, again, centerstat.org is uh, uh, gonna have all sorts of information that you need about uh, not only classes that we offer, but we got a boatload of free stuff. We have a free uh, three-day SEM workshop. We have a series of lectures on intensive longitudinal data that are completely free, a bunch of other stuff as well. And um, here's what we'd like to talk about. So the objectives for this section is to pretty much what Dan just said, is we want to introduce the building blocks of matrix algebra in terms of things that we're going to call scalars, that we're going to call vectors, and that we are going to call uh, full matrices, all right? And what I'd like to do is I'm going to define the core mathematical operations for these vectors and matrices. So how do we add them? How do we subtract them? How do we multiply them? And then I want to provide some basic understanding of the concepts of just how do we use these as we're trying to learn new materials, right? Is whether you, you know, are, are if you choose to continue your training with us, which we would love, but there are a lot of other uh, training opportunities that you might have, if nothing else than just reading, um, you know, your own literature or textbooks or computer manuals, is we will see that matrices are literally the foundation of any multivariate statistical approach. It could be multiple regression, moving into the multi-level model, the full-blown structural equation modeling, mixture modeling, machine learning. All of these things involve matrices. So we have a real motivation to try to better understand this stuff. All right. So why do we need matrices? What's the point, right? Is I often like asking, you know, kind of fundamental questions. One of my favorite questions to ask a grad uh, interviewer for our doctoral program is why do you want a PhD? Not why do you want to come to UNC for a PhD? Oh, damn, we forgot to mention we're both professors at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And not why you want to come to UNC, but why do you want a PhD at all? I like asking those questions. Why do we need matrices? Well, the first is um, multivariate models 
which are going to involve often multiple predictors and multiple outcomes, well, multivariate models can be expressed very efficiently and very compactly using matrices. What we're going to see is part of the magic of matrices are they expand and contract to fit whatever characteristics of your modeling, your, your data that you have. So a very famous matrix expression is X prime X inverse X prime Y, right? At the end of this hour, you'll get a sense of what that represents. But what that does is that gives you your regression coefficients in a multiple regression. Well, it's X prime X inverse X prime Y if you have 10 subjects and three variables, or if you have a million subjects and 300 variables, it's exactly the same thing. So it's very efficient. It's very elegant. It's very compact. As Dan alluded to, is having even a passing knowledge about matrices helps us understand the model itself. All right. So we believe very strongly in the teaching that we do in CenterStat is we want to get an understanding of what's happening under the hood, right? Is what is the model doing? What are you doing in an exploratory factor analysis? What are you doing in a growth mixture model and trying to understand that? And having an understanding of the matrices really helps convey a deeper understanding of the statistical procedure. But there's also a very pragmatic element is you're going to run into a problem at some point and you're going to need to Google um, some error message, and you need to navigate technical resources or textbooks or computer manuals or a Wikipedia page or whatever that might be. There's still a handful of programs, not as many as when Dan and I came up through the system, but there's still a handful of programs that are set up solely in matrix form. You actually have to define the model in matrices. You know what's more important, I feel like, is even if you're using a program that isn't based in matrix expressions, you're going to get error messages. All right, ready? I'm going to change color to red just to be more alarming. One of the most common is psi matrix is not positive definite. Now, just to make sure you feel bad enough about yourself, that you often get in all capital letters. So you feel like the program is yelling at you. Well, one, what is the psi matrix? And two, what does it mean if it's not positive definite? And three, is that something I should worry about, right? Because some some things are, eh, just wanted to let you know, here's a warning. Other things are, this is not a maximum likelihood solution, and you cannot interpret the parameters. Another one you'll get if you're a multi-level modeler is Hessian matrix cannot be inverted. And, you know, a good mouthful is the model is inadmissible due to a singularity in sigma. All right, what do any of these mean? Well, we're going to talk about that. All right. And then most importantly, matrices make the world a happier place. This is my first opportunity to correct you. I don't think so. Do matrices really make the world a happier place, Patrick? They make me happier and that's all that matters. Oh, okay. Right? Because we all agree it's about me, right? Didn't we agree on that? And it seems like go, it's been that for a while. Go back to sleep. <laughs> go back to sleep. Jeez. If anyone wants to co-teach with me, just send me an email. So we already know matrices. This is the fun thing. All right, we're going to refer to a matrix as a doubly ordered arrangement of numbers. What does that mean? Doubly ordered, it just means that we're going to have two categories. And what we're going to do is talk about rows and columns. Well, every one of us in one way or another, whether you know it or not, is we've worked with raw data matrices whether it be an Excel spreadsheet, whether it be tabular data that you had to do in a class. But a data matrix typically has N rows where that's your sample size. So if we have a sample of 100, there are 100 rows. And then we have what are called P columns where P is the number of variables. All right, so I'm in the first row and let's say we have five variables. I, I am in that first row and my response to variable one is the first element, second, third, fourth, fifth. Dan is second, first, second, third, fourth, fifth. You are third, and it goes all the way down to however many subjects we have. That's a data matrix. We all are familiar with a correlation matrix, right? Is it's a, a square matrix because it's P by P, and it contains our correlations or maybe covariances if we're working with a variance covariance matrix. And then you want to get super basic as a calendar. Think about just a monthly calendar. 
Well, it is a doubly ordered arrangement of numbers. The rows represent the weeks, the columns represent the days, and if you go into the interior of the, the calendar, you can find a particular day in a particular week. So we actually already know quite a bit about matrices. You just didn't know it. We just like confusing you by with new notation and new names. All right. So to demonstrate that, we're going to start right off by saying, OK, remember when you were like five years old and learned about numbers, a one, a two, a five, a nine, whatever that might be. We're going to call those scalars. All right. Why do we do that? Well, one is we like taking things that you understand perfectly well and renaming them just to try to make ourselves feel better about it. So we're going to refer to those as a scalar. And it's important in matrix algebra, though, because what we're going to do is we're going to use these, yes, as ordinary numbers, but we're going to use these either as what are called elements of a matrix. That's what lives inside of the matrix. Or more importantly, we're going to do things like add or subtract or multiply or divide by scalars to do things that we might want, right? For example, add up a series of numbers and divide by how many there are to get a mean, right? That would be a scalar division. And we're going to show you that in a few slides. And so the algebra of scalars is just arithmetic, right? Is if lowercase italic a is negative six and lowercase italic B is five, A plus B is, wait for it, negative six plus five is negative one. Why do we denote those with lowercase italic? It's arbitrary. We just all agree, right? It's kind of like, hey, everybody look up here. All right, do I have your attention? All right, if we have a lowercase italic that's not bolded, we're all gonna agree that's a scalar. Is everybody cool with that? Everybody says, yeah, we're cool with that. Great. Now, lowercase italic is a scalar, and we all agree on that. It's kind of like for those of you who, who play music is, you know, a, a, a musical representation is just arbitrary that we all agree on. A solid dot with a vertical line. All right, it's a total arbitrary thing, but we snap our fingers and say, if anybody anywhere in the world sees that, we all agree it's a quarter note. Is everybody cool? And everybody says, yeah, we're cool. So that's all we're doing. Lowercase italic is going to be a scalar, and that just represents numbers. All right, well, what is a matrix? Well, we can now generalize our definition to be a matrix as a doubly ordered arrangement of scalars, all right? What we're also going to see with the word scalar is why it's called that is we're going to use it to rescale certain things, right? If we multiply by a value greater than one, it's going to lengthen it. If we multiply it by a value less than one, it's going to shorten it. If we multiply it by a negative number, it's going to reflect it, right? So you can think about a scalar as a factor in which we're going to rescale things that we already have. And again, in a very selfish way, we're going to want to do it to meet our needs, Right, as if I want to add things up and divide by how many there are to get a mean, I'm going to do that by rescaling the sum by dividing by how many elements went into it. All right, again, same thing. We're going to snap our fingers and say we're going to start with rows, and those are going to represent one set of categories, and the columns are going to represent another one. All right, and how are we going to differentiate a matrix from other things? Notice it is a capital bold. All right, capital A bold and capital B bold. Do you know why it's capital bold? Yeah, nobody does. We just all agreed on it, right? Is it, it could be anything we wanted as long as we all agree on it. And so capital bold A, without looking at what's to the right of the equal sign, if I see a capital bold letter, I immediately know that it's a matrix that has multiple rows and multiple columns. All right, so... A is we're going to cleverly call a rectangular matrix because it has two rows and four columns. B, we're going to equally cleverly call a square matrix because it has the same number of rows as columns. Okay. Now, you will often hear what's called the order of a matrix. All right. So again, if you're at your, your cocktail party with fellow graduate students and somebody somehow says, well, what is the order of your data matrix? All that is, is how many rows by how many columns is it? What are the dimensions? That's another way that we can think about it. What are the dimensions of your matrix? 
by convention, no different than how we denote a quarter note on a sheet music, is the first number is always the number of rows, and the second number is always the number of columns. All right, so in this matrix A, so notice how things are already fitting together. We have a bold capital letter, so we know it's a matrix, and the order is three by four. That's how you read that. It's a three by four matrix. Well, what does that mean? There are three rows and there are four columns. All right, you always do row first, column second. Why? Because we agree on that. All right, so A is a three by four rectangular matrix. Now, a matrix, because it's a doubly ordered arrangement of scalars, is it's made up of what we're going to call elements, right? You see, we just make up a whole bunch of, of terminology for this stuff just to confuse you, right? As we're going we're gonna to call a, a number a scalar, and then we're going to call a number that's within a matrix an element. All right, that's fine. We can do that. Is, let's say we have matrix A, cap A. All right, that's bold. And we want to know row I and column J. All right, now I know this is a new notation, but all that means is a given column that we're going to denote by I, excuse me, a, a given row that we're going to denote by I, maybe it's row two or three or four, and column J. Well, we're going to give it a little postal address. Do you see this little guy? The lowercase italic sub I J. All that is is the scalar element that lives in that cubbyhole right? You can think about matrices as just things you buy at Ikea, right? They're just a storage system. That's quite literally all matrices are, are a storage system that we can then go do things with, all right? So for example, let's go back to matrix A here on the lower left. Well, we know it's a matrix because it's cat bold. We know that it's rectangular and the order is two by three. What if we wanted the one three element, all right, remember row is first, column is second. Well, if I want the one three element, I go to the first row and the third element, and that's eight. All right, the first row and the third element. Well, that's then what a one three is. See, it's just that what is in that cubby hole. All right, picture the whatever you get at Ikea, the Orsta Borsta Versting Dingin is what this is, and that element is eight. All right, B, we saw this before. It's a two, it's, excuse me, we have a two by three. It's not the same B, we changed that. But what is the two one element? Well, we go to the second row and the first column and that's nine. So you can see we have a whole postal address system of given the order of a matrix of where any element is in that particular cubby hole. Now notice the way that we presented these is A and B are actually equal. To one another. Yes, because A is equal to B, because notice the first one one element is three, the one two element is four, and we can do that for all the elements. They're identical. We can lay them on top of each other, and all the scalars in the same places within the matrix are the same, so we say that A is equal to B. All right, if even one element was off by a gabillionth of a point, then the matrices are not equal. Even though they're the same order, they are not equal because they don't have identical values in each of the element spaces within the matrix. A huge thing that we're going to use all the time in, uh, uh, in multivariate statistics and almost anything that you will learn beyond this involves the transpose of a matrix. All a transpose is, is you take whatever your target matrix is. Maybe it's rectangular, maybe it's square, maybe it has more rows than columns, maybe more columns than rows, doesn't matter. All right, whatever your matrix is, and we semi-drunkenly push it on its side. All right, what does that mean a little bit more formally? Well, what we're going to do is here's target matrix A, all right, cap bold row by column. So this is two by three. Notice the first row. The first row contains six, two, and four. Well, the general rule for a transpose is we're going to make, we're going to take the first row of our target matrix and we're simply going to make it the first column of our transposed matrix. All right? Do you see how the first row of A became the first column of A prime? The second row of A 
becomes the second column of a prime. Notice the numerical values are all the same. We've just pushed it on its side. And how are we going to tell the difference? You often just put a prime sign on that. Sometimes in some textbooks or articles or computer programs, you might actually see a T for transpose. It's very often just a prime. All right. So we've not changed the information. Right. Is the A contains the value 624810 and A prime contains the value 624810. We've simply taken A and rotated it so that the first row is the first column, the second row is the second column, and so on. All right. Well, why do we do that? Well, what we're going to see is we're going to be able to take a matrix and multiply it by its own transpose and get things like sums of squares or variability or sums of squares and cross products. All right. So um, the very first thing I said a few minutes ago was in the matrix expression for multiple regression coefficients is X prime X inverse. Well, there's the X prime X as we're transposing X and multiplying it by itself. We're getting a sums of squares and cross products matrix that represents our uh, relations among our X variables. We'll get to that in a bit. And then you'll get to it more in a particular class that, that you're attending. So now let's think about what we just did with a transpose, but use that to define another term that you all are probably very familiar with, is we can define a particular kind of matrix that we're going to call symmetric. All right, it's a symmetric matrix. Technically, what it means is that the transpose of the matrix is equal to the target matrix. All right, that if you have A, and you transpose it and have a prime and they are the same, then it's called a symmetric matrix. Let's see how that works. All right. So here's R. All right. This is a correlation matrix. We are very familiar because symmetric matrices, we have our covariance matrices, correlation matrices, things called distance matrices. You get these in network analyses and machine learning. You get these in cluster analyses. These are very common in these distance matrices. But let's do what I did before. We're going to take the first row of R and we're going to make it the first column of R. All right. I'm going to change colors because we have a high tech operation here. I'm going to take the second row of R and make it the second column of R. You see the pattern already. Ooh, this is a pretty color. I'm going to take the third row, whoops, blew that, of R, make it the third column of R. So notice R, we've transposed to R, R prime, right? Now let's wipe those clean and notice that they're the same, right? Because the first row is already that first column, right? Notice that I'll still use my pretty purple or whatever number that is, or <laughs> number, eh, got numbers on the mind, whatever color that is. Notice the first row is 1, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, but that's the same as the first column, 1, 0 0.2, 0 0.4. And we can do our high tech. Notice the, the second column and the second row are also the same. So we don't have to transpose. It's exactly the same. And the reason is, is what you learned early in a statistics class is if you have a symmetric matrix, that the values above the diagonal are going to be the same as the values below the diagonal, right? The 2, 1 element here is 0.2. The 1, 2 element is 0.2. And that's why often when we see these in published papers or in, in you know, a, a textbook or something like that, is often um, the upper diagonal is not even given is that we can do a high tech scratching that out. And if you have the lower diagonal, you have the upper diagonal, so we're not even gonna present it. But that's a formal definition of symmetric, is that um, a square matrix that is transposed is equal to itself. All right, now we're cooking with gas. All right, we got rectangular matrices, we have square matrices, we have transposes, we have um, symmetric matrices. Let's think about a couple of special kinds of matrices, and again, these are going to come up in a lot of what you learn, particularly this one. 
imagine we have a covariance matrix. So you may have been exposed to this in a class before. You have four measures. Doesn't matter what they are. They're just four measures of something, right? Four variables. And these are the variances and the covariances. And because we all agreed on it, we see that it's capital bold S, so we know it's a matrix. This is four by four, so it's a square matrix. And it's symmetric because we don't need to present the values above the diagonal, right? Everything starts clicking together. Well, there are reasons why we might be inclined to pick off just the diagonal elements. Remember, in a variance-covariance matrix, those diagonal elements are the variances of the variables. So say you have four items assessing depression, item one, two, three, and four. Those are just the four variances. The off-diagonals are the covariances. Well, there's some reasons and some models why we might want a matrix that only has the variance, and that's the diagonal matrices. All right, we're going to cleverly refer to that as diag, and notice that what we've done is simply picked off the diagonal elements from the, the matrix, but we have zeros everywhere else. Well, why on earth would we ever want to do that? Well, if you've ever done a factor analysis, or if you've done a confirmatory factor analysis, or if you have dependent variables in a structural equation model that don't correlate with one another, these things each have variances, but we don't allow them to co-vary with one another. So, it's a diagonal matrix with variances on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. That's a very common structure that we're going to encounter in almost everything that, that you will learn about. All right. What is a special kind of uh, diagonal matrix? It's called the identity matrix. And this is another snap your fingers. Everybody look up at me. Look here. Is that anytime we name a matrix I, capital I bold, that that's going to represent an identity matrix, all right? So if you have a quarter note, we're saying, hey, everybody up here, if we take a, a vertical line on a black dot and put a little wavy flag, the quarter note becomes an eighth note. Why a little wavy flag? I have no freaking idea, but if we all agree on it, it works. Here, capital I is the identity matrix. Notice that what we've done is we've created a diagonal matrix that's square, and it has ones on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. Well, what's really cool about this is this plays the same role as the number one in arithmetic, right? Well, who cares? Why would you care about the number one? Well, if we're trying to divide two sides by something and we want to make one side go away and move over to the other side, when we divide those things, it becomes one and we can drop it. We're going to do exactly the same thing here. All right. So it's called an identity matrix. And you will encounter these in many, many things that you're going to learn. All right. Now, this gets kind of fun. All right, the matrix that we've been working with up to this point has been doubly ordered. We have multiple rows and we have multiple columns. It is hugely common in everything that you're going to learn beyond this to have a particular kind of matrix. And we're going to call that matrix a vector. All right, it is a vector. And what a vector is, is it is technically a matrix, but it only has one row or one column depending upon whether we transpose it or not. All right, so we can talk about a column vector or a row vector, and it's exactly what you would think. A column vector has multiple rows and just one column. Well, that's what this is on the left. All right, now notice we've used a new notation. Instead of uppercase bold, we have lowercase bold. So lowercase x bold indicates that we have multiple rows and one column. Well, why would you ever do that? Why would you ever encounter? Well, think about your multiple regression model. You have multiple predictors in X, and so you're going to have a, an N by P data matrix because you have P variables. But in a multiple regression model, we only have one dependent variable. Well, we need multiple rows for each person, but only one column to capture that dependent variable. So our outcome on in a multiple regression is a vector called y, all right? So that's the row, that, that's the column vector, multiple rows, one column. 
we can transpose it just as we did before. All right. And so what we can do is we can define a row vector. And all we do is shove the column vector on its side. Right. Notice here that we put the prime sign on it. This does not have the prime sign on it. So if you see a lowercase bold letter, that indicates by default a column vector. And if there's a prime on it, it means a row vector. And again, these play a role in everything that we do. Is Remember I said it was X prime X inverse X prime Y for OLS regression? Well, that Y is a column vector because we have one dependent variable and each person only has a single value on that dependent variable. Now, if you take structural equation models and you move into, say, a path analysis where you have multiple dependent variables, well, then little column vector Y becomes a full matrix Y. So you have a full matrix of Xs, which are your predictors, and you have a full matrix of Y that are your dependent variables. Never move beyond this is just an IKEA storage system. If you only have one Y, you just need the one vector. If you have more than one Y, then you need as many vectors as are you are you going to jump on me about ikea no i'm not but i i feel compelled to insert a little anecdote if that's okay <laughs> with you is it going to reflect poorly on me because most of your anecdotes <laughs> do that is true never mind <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, was just, I was just gonna say so so as patrick said a vector is by default a column vector unless you transpose it and then it's a row vector and i remember you know, Patrick and I, we're old, so we came up we with are. SAS and SPSS, and, and at one point we decided we would try to learn R a little bit, and we were sitting in this little workshop on R, <laughs> and the presenter's talking about defining a vector in R, and Patrick's like, well, is that a, is that a column vector or a row vector? And they're like, it doesn't matter. I think Patrick's eyeballs <laughs> actually fell out of his head at that point, and in R, it will actually switch it from a row to a column, depending on the operations you're doing, just to be nice to you. But And so that's why the presenter was like, well, it doesn't matter. But Patrick was like, it matters. I, is it a column or is it a row? And then when they said that, he was like, I'm out. I don't, I don't even want to know how I to did. use I did. I tapped out. I like never learned R just because of that one answer. That was like 20 years ago. Yeah, but I file these things away. I, you do in a very frightening way. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry you have to go, but I understand. There we go. <laughs> Another one is one of my favorite movies, and none of you have seen this, I guarantee you, is um, the movie Airplane, mostly because if you're watching this, that you were probably born after, like 20 years after Airplane was. But um, it's one of my favorite movies of all time. And there's a scene in there where they say, I need a vector, Victor. Roger, Roger, over Unger. And I always think about that as I need a vector, Victor, is this is your vector. And it does matter if it's column or row. Don't, don't mess with me. All right. So we got column vector. We got a row vector. Think about how much we've done in just half an hour is we got square. We got rectangle. We got symmetric. We have transposes. We've got vectors. Um is now we've got a whole lot of the building blocks. Now I'm going to like bend your mind. And this is really cool. And then Dan in a little bit is going to bend your mind even further. Another one of my favorite movies is The Matrix. And that famous scene at the end where he sees all the numbers coming down and he like sees the computer program that's The Matrix. I sometimes feel this way with geometric expressions. Is like the whole movie is he couldn't see The Matrix. He couldn't see The Matrix. And then all of a sudden he could see The Matrix. Why is it called a vector? We can motivate all of multivariate statistics from a geometric perspective. That is literally talking about planes and surfaces and cubes and hypercubes and volumes and angles. Um, Greg Hancock and I teach a factor analysis class, and we show in there that the cosine of an angle between two vectors is actually the correlation between two latent factors. It's absolutely fascinating. The hard thing about learning it is you can only really see it in two dimensions because then in three dimensions, we can move into a cube and in four dimensions, I tap out. Maybe Stephen Hawking can see in ultimate dimensions. I can't, all right? But let's take a simple little vector um, and we're going to call it A, and it's going to have two elements, four and five. 
All right, so it's a two by one column vector. Bam, we know it right away. Well, look what we can do. From a geometric standpoint, we can start at the origin and go out to four, which is the first element. We can go up to five, which is the second element, right? It's four, five. And darned if that doesn't define this literal geometric vector of distance four or five. It has a distance. It has an orientation in space. Now, this is the simplest expression that we can do with these. And Dan is going to have fun in a bit because he's going to talk about, well, how do we do vectors to get the, the middle of a mass of vectors? And it's going to be a mean. And we can talk about the area of a parallelogram. And that's going to be a determinant. Ha <laughs> ha, Dan, I took all your thunder away. But just know that anything we work with these um, algebraic vectors, they map onto geometric vectors. And we can use these a lot in multivariate statistics to think about how are things oriented together in space. One of the most famous books written in psychometrics, that is the study of you know, psychological processes, is by L. L. Thurstone. And the title of the book is brilliant. It's called Vectors of Mind. Well, he was trying to build factor models to measure intellectual ability in human beings, and he identified seven primary mental factors, right? These skills that you could have, and each one was defined as this vector that went out in a multidimensional space, and those were the vectors of mind. Totally cool. All right, so it's a little harder to visualize, but we'll show you a few more things as we proceed, where in lower dimensions, you can get your head around it. And then in higher dimensions, you just nod wisely and say, well, of course, it's a hypercube. I mean, what else would it be? So given that with the vector in moving through space, let's think about taking two vectors and adding them. All right. So it's very simple. We have a, a, a vector of length n that we're going to call a, and that holds one set of categories, whatever that might be. All right, and we have vector B, and we can cleverly add A plus B, and what is it going to be? It's going to be A1 plus B1, is A1 plus B1 is going to be the new element of C. All right, so it's very simple. What is the big thing we got to do is we have to assume that the vectors are the same length, all right? They have to have the same number of rows, or else we can't add them, right? It's not fair. Right, You get to the end of one and you're done, but the other one still has more to it. You can't add it. All right, so they have to be the same length. All right, simple. In and out, nobody get hurt. You know, that's fine. But check this out. All right, now vector A, let's say, is two and five. All right, so let's do our little thing. We go out two units and go up five units, and that places vector A into a geometric space. B we go out three and up two, and that places the vector B, but we want to add them. Well, what is over here? We have two plus five is seven. All right. So we go out and notice two things. This, what we sometimes call a parallelogram law, is it's going to do two things. Is the new vector, which is C, right? Because we're literally building something new. It is going to bisect, so let me change colors so we can see it. It's going to bisect the two vectors, but it's going to combine the lengths of them, right? So we're taking one arrow for A, one arrow for B. We're bisecting them and putting them end to end, and that's vector C, all right? Why would we ever do that? Well, what if we want to compute, start to think about things like means or variances or things like that? Well, we want to begin by adding them up and then dividing by how many went into it. We can start to think about this both in algebraic and in geometric terms. All right. We've added vectors. You might say, wait a minute. What about the matrices? You bored us silly with matrices. Okay, dude, be cool. Everything's fine. Is we can add matrices in precisely the same way. The big thing that we have to do is have them called the same order, right? And the term that you sometimes get is, are they conformable? All right, so for addition, if we have a two by three 
matrix that we want to add to another matrix, it has to be two by three. Picture just adding it, you know, laying it on top of itself is we have one two by three matrix, we lay it on top of the other two by three, and we add the corresponding elements. So three plus two equals five. That's that new element. One plus four also equals five and so on. All right. And what's neat is matrix addition, all the nice rules we learned in arithmetic apply here. It's commutative and associate. So A plus B is equal to B plus A and so on. We can do A plus B plus C. And that's the same as doing B plus C first and then adding A or adding A and B and then adding C. These seem like little parlor tricks maybe of doing this, but it actually, when we start doing matrix algebra to get things out of our models that we want, these things can become very important, all right? So this is very, very straightforward. If you want to subtract instead of laying them on top of each other, then you can simply, you subtract one from the other. Or as we did with the vectors, is it's like adding a negative number is all. But now... From here, um, Dan gets to come in and say, well, let's start putting some stuff together. So I prattled on about the scalars, about the vectors, and about the matrices. But now, remember I said scalars rescale things? Is Dan is going to come in and show that geometrically, which I think is really cool. And I think it's kind of unfair that he gets to talk about it and is not that me. Is that why you already said everything that I'm about to say? I know. I get excited about it. You're like a scalar. It's going to stretch it. It's going to stretch it. Like, oh, that's my slide right there. That's it. You're welcome. It's, it's going to multiply through and increase the volume of them. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Here we go. So Dan and I have worked together for 20 years. We did a grant with, in collaboration with my wife, Andrea Hassan. The three of us ran it. The joke among the grad students was... Working with the research group is, it's great. You learn lots, you get publications, it's wonderful training, but you have to be able to put up with the couples bickering. But they were actually talking about me and Dan. So yeah, yeah. yeah. go ahead. There's a little bit of a dynamic there. <laughs> <laughs> I have to admit. Yeah, so, okay. So I'm going to take over and basically explain the foreshadowing that Patrick gave you earlier um, with some some specific slides that'll kind of hopefully make some of those things kind of come to life. Um, so here we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, earlier Patrick said part of the reason why we sometimes refer to these single numbers as scalars is because they can serve to scale a vector. They can shrink it, they can stretch it, they can reflect it. Uh, and so here we're going to see that. And that's where we take a vector and we multiply it by a scalar, right? So here we have a vector A and we have a scalar K and we're just multiplying them together, right? K times A. Now this is pretty simple to do. Scalar multiplication is an easy thing and it's going to work the same way for a matrix as it does for a vector is we just take every element within that vector A and multiply it by the scalar K. And what that's going to do, as Patrick mentioned, and so, yeah, you already know this, is to stretch, shrink, or potentially reflect the original vector, depending on what that scalar is. If the scalar is greater than one, right, then imagine if you're going to multiply that scalar in, it's just going to make all the elements in A bigger, right? So it's going to stretch that vector out in a geometric way of thinking about it as the vector is becoming longer in space. If K is between zero and one, right, then you're, you've got a fractional value for K, it's going to shrink down all the elements in A when you multiply it in. And if K is less than zero, right, so it's a negative number, then it's going to take that vector and it's just going to reverse it in direction, right? And if it's, if it's negative one, it's going to reverse it and it'll be the original length in space. It'll just be going in the opposite direction. But if it's greater than one, then it'll, it has a value more negative than negative one, right, then it's not only going to reflect it, it's going to also stretch it in that opposite direction and so on. So this is one of those places where it can be kind of helpful to have that geometric interpretation in terms of thinking about what scalar multiplication is all about, all right? So here's our original vector A. It has, you know, again, it's hard to visualize things outside of two-dimensional space. You can kind of visualize them in three-dimensional space. 
you get into like n dimensional space and it's it's pretty hard to do so you just start throwing around terms like hyperspace and hypervolumes and hyperspheres and people think you're really sophisticated even though nobody can actually visualize that right so we're going to keep things in two dimensions here all right so here's our original vector and our original vector right we start at the origin the zero zero point and we go out three on the x-axis and we go up two on the y-axis and that defines our vector a. Well, what if we multiplied a by the scalar two? We would just take each of those elements, three and two, and we would multiply by that scalar, right? So three times two is six, and two times two is four, and we're good to go. We have our new vector, right? And notice, I'm gonna be fancy like Patrick and switch colors, right? Notice that we've taken that original vector and we've doubled its length, right? It's still going in the same direction, but now it's twice as big, right? It's gonna be, I'm even gonna highlight it, right? It's gonna be twice as big as that original vector was because we multiplied by two, right? So we, we're going in the same direction, but we now have a vector that's twice as long, right? So that's if K is greater than one, right? That scalar is greater than one, then it's gonna stretch things out. But if K is between zero and one, so here it's one third, then it's gonna shrink things, right? So in this case, we're gonna get a vector that is a third as long as the original, right? It's gonna be this vector right here, all right? And so we're gonna take, again, each of those elements, I'm gonna get rid of some of the, the junk on here. We're gonna take each of these elements, multiply by one third, and we'll get the new values after that operation, right? So it's, it's just, simple scalar multiplication, or in this case, you could think of it as scalar division, dividing each element by three. And then the reflection part is if you have a negative value for that scalar. So here we have negative one times a, right? And so we have just the negative a. We take each of those original values, three and two, and we're gonna multiply each one by negative one. We get negative three and negative two, and notice that our vector is now I'm gonna go with Patrick's pretty purple color. Right now, our vector is going off in the opposite direction to the original vector, All right? So scalar multiplication is gonna allow us to do a variety of different kinds of things, right? And we can kind of visualize that well in the case of a vector times a scalar. In the case of a vector times a matrix, it kind of works the same way, but it's a little bit harder to, to visualize. All right, so let's, take just one moment to see at this point, we've learned enough operations that we can do something kind of useful. All right, so let's say you have a set of variables, right? Maybe you have P variables that you're interested in, and those variables are gonna have means associated with them. Well, we could put the means for all of those variables into a vector. So we have X bar one for variable one, we have X bar two for variable two, we have X bar three for variable three and so on, right? For however many uh, variables we have. So we'll have a P by one mean vector here. We're gonna designate that mean vector X bar, right? Now, how do we calculate that mean vector? Well, you know from, you know, calculating the mean of a single variable, right? You take your X, let's say we wanted X one, you take your X one values, for you know, each case, I equal one through N and you add them up and then you divide by N. Well, here we're gonna see how we can begin to use vectors and matrices to generalize our operations to account for however many variables there might be, right? So that would be for a single variable, but we have P variables and P might be three and P might be 400 and the very same matrix expression will hold for how to calculate the means of those variables, right? So we want the mean vector across a set of variables. We don't want just the mean for a single variable, right? And so now what we're going to do is instead of adding up the individual values on a single variable, we're going to add up the vectors, right? So each individual in our data set is going to have their own vector of values on this these set of variables, right? So here's the column vector for person one, the column vector for person two, the column vector for person three, and so on. And we're just going to add up those vectors across our n individuals and Patrick talked about vector addition and how that works and that's pretty straightforward. And then once we have those, once we've summed that up, then we're going to multiply by one over n, right? Scalar multiplication or equivalent to just scalar division. We're gonna divide 
by n. And then our result is going to be a vector of means. All right, so we'll have the means for all the different variables under consideration. All right, and again, you can sort of think of that, that multiplication by 1 over n as a shrinking that summed vector right in the numerator back into the original into the space of the original vectors right and so let's see that in a kind of a geometric representation so again we're going to work in the two-dimensional space just to kind of keep things easy and we've got three three different vectors that we're going to add up right so we've got vector a is for maybe person number one and vector b for person number two and vector c for person number three and we can see their vectors here is here's a here's b here's c right so those are our three sets of observations right for our three individuals and now we're going to add them up and we're going to calculate the mean vector right so we start by adding them up and then we're going to multiply by one over n the first two that we're going to add up and remember the order doesn't matter, Patrick talked about that, is that matrix addition, vector addition, uh, you can do it in whatever order you want. So we're gonna add A and B first. And when we add A and B together, following that, that parallelogram law that Patrick talked about is we get D, where D is gonna be just equal to A plus B. We take each of the elements, right? The element for A here is, you know, it's about two, five and B is about three, two, right? And we're just gonna add those up together and we'll get five, seven, right? As the, the point that we terminate at when we add those two vectors together, right? So now we have vector D, which is the sum of A and B. And now we need to add vector C to that to get the sum of all three, all right? So again, we can kind of follow that parallelogram rule and we can say, all right, well, this is the length of C right? We can append that to D, or here is D appended to C. Either way, we bisect that, right? And we're going to get this value here, where we just add up the elements, and we end up at this point, right? Now, every time we're adding these vectors together, we're getting longer and longer and longer, right? We want to bring that back into the original vector space, right? We do that by multiplying by one over n, in this case, one over three, All right? And so when we do that, what does that do? It shrinks that vector back into the original space and we end up right there, f, right? That's our mean vector. And that has the mean both in, you know, for the first variable here, as well as for the second variable. So it's a mean vector with two values within it for two different variables. Again, the cool thing about vectors and matrices is they just naturally expand to accommodate, you know, whatever dimensions your problem has. So if we're talking about, you know, we have 500 individuals on 15 variables. Cool, fine. I mean, it's harder to visualize, but the operations all work exactly the same way. The other thing that's kind of cool about this is that we can also view the mean as the center of mass of the points defined by the original vectors, right? So here, here's our vector B, here's our vector C, here's our vector A, right? And here they're defined with these values. And you can kind of draw a shape, right? You can kind of connect the, the dots here to get a, a sort of a surface. Imagine that this is like a plate, right? Obviously, it's not a dinner plate or it would look more like a circle. But imagine that you're, you're trying to balance this irregular triangular plate on a stick or on a pencil, right? So you got to kind of get it on your pencil eraser and have it stay in place. Well, the mean vector is that center of mass, right, where you would have to put the eraser of your pencil to keep this plate from tipping off in any particular direction. And so that's kind of cool, is that you can think of your mean vector as the center of all of the, the data points, of all of those original vectors. And that's why it's sometimes referred to as a centroid, right? It's the center, but when you start going out into hyperspace, you have to give it a fancy name. So we call it a centroid. Um, and that's what that mean vector is capturing. Uh-oh, 
Patrick, you got a snarky comment to add? <laughs> you know what? For the record, I do not. Oh, is, very nice. I, I, what I really like about this is if you're new to seeing vectors in a geometric uh, uh, representation is I, I can speak just from my own learning in this way because I didn't originally learn in geometry and I kind of had to fight my way into it. And you might keep asking yourself, why, 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 who cares? You know, great, you can do it in this way, you know, that that you could also, you know, do it in in some other way that I don't care about. Well, Dan used a really important word there about the centroid. And when you start thinking about, well, that X bar is a, 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 the center of the mass, you can start thinking about, well, how far is A and B and C away from that centroid? Are there some vectors that are closer? Are there some vectors that are farther apart? Is there a D maybe that Dan could put in that's like really far away? And we might want to say, huh, I wonder if that's like an outlier. I wonder if we could get a distance from that. Maybe you have a whole boatload of vectors and some kind of center around one centroid, but some center around another centroid. Well, that starts making you think about cluster analysis kinds of things. And so it's not just, hey, guys, look what I found. We can do this. When you start thinking about a swarm of these vectors around middle points, this opens up a whole class of kind of questions that might be both really important to ask ourselves from, say, outlier diagnostics, Mahala Nobis, Cook's distance, things like that, but also saying, I wonder if there's one centroid or maybe two centroids or maybe three centroids, and then we're off to the races and very cool stuff. Did I take more of your thunder? No, I just was, I still was waiting for some snark somehow at the end. I I'm going to save it up. Okay. okay. All right. That's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I, I mean, I think that's a great point is once we begin to kind of think of that mean vector as a center of mass, then there are lots of things that we can kind of connect to that. Is, is there one center of mass where there's you know, everything is kind of grouped around that, or might there be multiple centers of mass where there are different kind of lumps in this uh, in this space? And so it, it does get pretty interesting to think about. All right, so I mentioned that just like vector, when we multiply a vector by a scalar, right? When we do that, we're multiplying each element in that vector by the scalar. The same thing happens when we multiply a matrix by a scalar. So now we have a matrix, capital bold A, multiplied by scalar K. And it's going to work the exact same way. We're just going to multiply each element in A by that scalar K. Now, you might be saying to yourself, why the heck would I do that? When would I ever do that? Well, there are times when we're going to want to do that. An example, sometimes we might want to specify a model in which we have a couple of different groups in the data. And we want to allow for some heteroscedasticity across those two groups, right? We don't necessarily think they have the exact same variance covariance matrix. But maybe we think that they're kind of similar in pattern. Well, we could specify a model in which we say, okay, I've got a covariance matrix for group one, right? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call that sigma one. And I need to say what the covariance matrix in group two is relative to that group one. So sigma two is group two's covariance matrix and sigma one is group one's covariance matrix. And I'm going to specify the constraint that these are proportional to one another, right? So in group two... I've got different variances and covariances than I have in group one, but they're all different in the same way, right? They're scaling up or scaling down by the scalar K, right? So what K is going to do is it's going to sort of take the, the volume of the covariance matrix for group one, and it's just going to inflate it, right? If K is greater than one, then those variances and covariances get bigger. It's like blowing up a balloon, right? If K is less than one, then it gets smaller. And there's less variance in group two than there is in group one. But the relative pattern is maintained, so we would have equal correlations among the variables across the two groups, but just differences in variance and in, in that volume or heteroscedasticity that we see across the two groups. So that's just one example of where you might see a matrix multiplied by a scalar. 
All right, so scalar multiplication is fairly easy. Right? We just take each element of the vector or the matrix and we multiply it by the scalar. Matrix multiplication is a little bit trickier. So here's where we want to multiply one matrix by another. Or it could be, you know, a vector is a special case of a matrix. It could be one vector by another. This is a very common kind of operation to multiply two matrices together. And it works a little bit differently than what you might expect. It's not terribly intuitive to think about how matrix multiplication works. So we're going to kind of walk you through it. We'll give you a couple of different rules here, and then we're going to see it. And when you see it, the rules will make sense. And until then, you might be saying, what, what are these rules doing? Um, so rule number one, to be conformable. So that's a term you'll hear a lot about in matrix algebra. Lots of times you'll hear it. Vectors are conformable if, matrices are conformable if. Conformability just means you can do it, right? The, the vectors or matrices are of the correct order, right, to be able to do this operation. So when can we multiply one matrix by another? Well, we can only do it if they have, you know, a particular form where the matrix that comes first and here, order does matter. The pre-multiplier matrix has the same number of columns as the post-multiplier matrix has rows, right? So we kind of write out the order of our matrices. We have a matrix A here that has P by Q rows and columns, and we have a matrix B here that has Q by K rows and columns. And notice that the columns of A have to match the rows of B. The rows of A don't have to match the columns of B. Those can be whatever they want to be. But those interior elements, right, those interior values to the two orders, right, the number of columns of A and the number of rows of B, those have to match for matrix multiplication to work, for the matrices to be conformable for matrix multiplication. And we'll kind of see why in the in how matrix multiplication works in just a little bit, right? But that's just a rule to know. All right, so these numbers have to match for the pre-multiplier and the post-multiplier matrix. And then what does the product matrix look like, right? So we're gonna multiply matrix A by matrix B and they have to match on those values. Well, the order of the product matrix, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take those exterior values, the P and the K here, and those are gonna define the order of the matrix that comes out, All right? So if A is P by Q and B is Q by K, we know they are conformable because the number of columns in A matches the number of rows in B. And we know that the product matrix is gonna take the rows from A and the columns from B to define its order. All right, so that tells us what the matrix is gonna look like, but what the heck goes inside it, right? So we know that that C matrix is going to have P rows and K columns from this little rule. But what are the elements within C look like? Well, it's a little tricky. Here is the formula for that is each element, each row column position within C, right? So element Cij is row I column J in this matrix, right? That element that occupies that cubby hole. Right, to get that, we're going to take the values from A, from matrix A, the elements in there, and the elements from B in this very particular way, and we're going to multiply them together and add them up. Right? So we're going to take the rows of A and multiply by the columns of B, and we're going we're to multiply by the corresponding values, and then we're going to sum them up. And so that's like mathematically how we express it, but it's much easier to just see it. And so here we're gonna look at a, a simple example. So we have a matrix A with two rows, three columns. We have a matrix B with three rows, two columns, right? So here's our A, here's our B, right? You can see two rows, three columns for A, and you can see three uh, rows and two columns for B. All right, those interior values match, right? So we know the matrices are conformable for multiplication, right? And the exterior values, the two and the two here, are going to define the order of our new matrix C, right? So C is going to be a two by two. 
And so we know, okay, I can, I can draw my brackets. I'm going to have two rows and I'm going to have two columns, but what goes inside of those uh, rows and columns, right? What are those elements going to be? Well, we take each row of A and we multiply by each row of, or each column, sorry, of B, All right? So we take the two from the first row of A and we multiply by the one from the first column of B. We take the four from the first row of A and we multiply, or for, sorry, the four from the first row, second column of A, and we multiply it by the second row of B, right? So what we're doing is we're taking corresponding pairs of elements, right? So we're going to focus on this row and this column first. We're going to take this two times that one. We're going to take this four times that two we're going to take this one times that four, right? And so we're going to take each pair and we're going to multiply them together and then we're going to add them up. So we take two times one plus four times two plus one times four, we get 14. And that's going to be the element in the one, one position because we took row one of A and column one of B. Now we're going to do the same thing except we're going to say, okay, I did row one, column one. Let me do row one, column two, All right? So I'm going to go grab column two from matrix B. Again, I've got two times three, four times zero, one times two, and I add them up and I get eight. All right. So now that goes in my one, two position because I used row one and column two. All right, now I've exhausted row one of A, and so I move to row two and I do it all over again. All right now I multiply row two by column one of B, and then I'm going to say, okay, once I've got that, right, that's going to be 19. I'm going to plug that in here, all right, and then I have my last combination where I'm going to say, okay, let me grab that row and that column, and that's going to go in the two, two position. And notice that we're taking sums of products. Well, when Patrick was stealing my thunder earlier, he was talking about how matrix multiplication using transposes can provide you with sums of squares and cross products. So imagine that we have matrix X, which is a data matrix, and we take X prime X. Well, what's that gonna do is we're gonna have all of those values essentially multiplied together using sums of squares, right? These are sums of products. And if it's the same variable, right? If it's a variable with itself, then it's gonna be a sum of squares. And if it's a variable with another variable, then it's gonna be a sum of cross products. So we very often are gonna see matrices transposed and multiplied by themselves to get us sums of squares and cross products. It's a very common thing to see in these kind of multivariate models. All right, so that was matrix multiplication. How about matrix division? The easy answer is you can't do it. There is no matrix division. There is no way to multiply a, or divide a matrix by another matrix. The only operation that exists is matrix multiplication. We cannot divide a matrix by another matrix. All right, so that's where, as Patrick said at the beginning, you swirl your wine glass and you say, no, no, no. Matrix division is not defined, my dear. Um, and you, you know, you sound snooty. All right, but okay, so you can't divide one matrix by another, but what can you do? Because there are going to be times where we want to do things like division. And so how do we accomplish that? Well, what we do is instead of divide, we multiply by the inverse of a matrix, right? And this basically builds on something that you're already quite familiar with, which is if you wanted to say divide five by five, right? That's equivalent to saying five times one over five, right? Multiplying by the inverse, right? So if we have five and we multiply by five inverse, an inverse is typically designated by a negative one in the power, right in the superscript, right? So we multiply five by its inverse, then we're gonna end up with a value one, right? Well, the same thing works in matrix algebra is we can define the inverse of a matrix 
to be that matrix, which when multiplied by the original gives us an identity matrix. Remember Patrick said the identity matrix takes on the same meaning in matrix algebra as the number one has in arithmetic, right? So in arithmetic, if we multiply a number by its inverse in whichever order we want, we get the number one, right? In matrix algebra, an inverse is defined as that matrix, right? So A inverse is the matrix, which when multiplied by the original matrix A gives us the identity matrix. And in this case, order does not matter. You can multiply it in either direction and get the identity matrix. All right, so we will often see inverses of matrices. We see inverted matrices, um, in particular, the covariance or correlation matrix. We see these in formulas for Mahalanobis distance, right? We're taking uh, distances of each individual vector from the centroid, right? Remember Patrick was talking about sometimes you can use these kinds of ideas to think about outliers. Mahalanobis distance is sometimes used to think about outliers. So how far is an individual data vector from that center of mass, that centroid? Well, we can look at how far each person's score is on each variable relative to the mean, but some variables have more variance than other variables, and some variables are more correlated than other variables. And so what you'll find is in the Mahalanobis distance formula to account for this, uh, the inverse of the covariance matrix is in there to sort of account for the fact that some variables have a wider scale than other variables, and we want to sort of adjust for that. We'll see it also in the multivariate normal density function, and you see it in the estimation of OLS regression weights as Patrick referred to the classic formula X prime X inverse X prime Y. That is the formula to get your regression slopes, right? That gives you your regression weights. And you can see right in here, we're getting sums of squares and cross products, right? We're inverting them. And this is sort of capturing how the X variables are related to one another. And then here we're looking at how are the X variables related to the Y variables, right? And at the end of the day, we perform this operation and we get our beta vector. But there sits our inverse, right? And that's to accomplish the equivalent of division, right? All right. So we do see inverses of matrices in a lot of different uh, expressions of our models. Here's a kind of a simple example of how we can use these matrix operations to solve for some unknowns in an equation. All right, so let's say we have matrix A and we have vector B, right? And we need to solve for vector X. And we know this relationship to be true, right? So we would like to take our known quantities for A and B and solve for x from this expression. All right, so if you were using your usual rules of arithmetic, you would say, oh, I know what to do. We can just divide each side by a, right? And then a is gonna cancel out and x is equal to b divided by a. But then the snooty person at the cocktail party swirls their wine and says, oh, but no, you're not allowed to divide by a. There is no division in matrix algebra. Right, so we can't do that simple operation that we have in arithmetic. We have to be a little more clever about it. And so what do we do? We say, well, I need that A to go away. Well, if I had one times X, right, then that would just be equal to X, right? So somehow I got to turn that A into a one, right? And in arithmetic, the way we would do that is we would just divide it by A, and that would make that one, and then we would be done. Here we can't do that, but we can rely on the fact that we know that if we multiply a matrix by its inverse, that gives us the identity matrix, which functions just like the number one, right? So here, that's exactly how we're gonna solve this problem. I say, okay, I need to get rid of this A. So I'm gonna turn this thing into an identity matrix by multiplying both sides by A inverse, right? So I have A inverse A times X and I have A inverse B. I've just pre-multiplied on both sides by the inverse of A. All right, well, A inverse A by definition is gonna give me the identity matrix. 
And the identity matrix multiplied by anything, just like the number one multiplied by anything, just gives you back that thing, right? So we can just say x is equal to a inverse b. Notice how we didn't have to do any division. We just had to calculate the inverse. And by having an inverse, we could kind of move all of the knowns to one side of the equation to isolate the unknown. So matrix algebra is actually kind of fun once you sort of learn these basic rules for how to do things. Now, one thing that is a little bit challenging is how to actually calculate the inverse of a matrix. Fortunately, computers will do that for us. But one quantity that is important for calculating the inverse of a matrix, and also important in its own right in some, some aspects, is a thing called the determinant. This is another new thing in matrix algebra. This is not something you'll have encountered before in arithmetic, right? So the determinant of a matrix is denoted by putting that matrix within these vertical bars. It kind of looks like an absolute value symbol, but it's a completely different thing. It has no relationship to the absolute value that you're, you're familiar with from arithmetic, right? But if you see a matrix inside these kind of vertical bars, then you know that you're talking about the determinant. What the determinant represents, so the determinant is only something you can calculate on a square matrix, and often you'll be calculating the determinant on something like a covariance matrix or a correlation matrix, right? And if you take the determinant of a covariance matrix, you're going to get a single number, a scalar value, that's going to reflect how much variance overall is there in the set of variables within that covariance matrix. All right, so that single number sort of represents the generalized variance within a set of variables, right? Well, what the heck does generalized variance mean? Well, if variables, you know, if each variable has a lot of variance, then that's going to tend to make the determinant bigger. But if variables are really highly correlated, then there's a lot of redundancy there, and that's going to make the determinant smaller. So the determinant is going to take account of both the individual variances of each variable, as well as how highly correlated these variables are with one another, and return a single number that represents how much overall variance is there across all these different variables in your, your uh, system of interest. All right, so a few things about determinants. Can only do it on square matrices. So for example, correlation and covariance matrices are where you'll commonly see this. The maximum value of the determinant for a correlation matrix is 1. If the determinant is zero, then the matrix is referred to as being singular or not of full rank, right? That will occur if one variable has no variance or variables have perfect correlation with one another, right? In either case, your matrix actually doesn't have, like maybe you have a three by three covariance matrix, but your, your matrix really doesn't have three dimensions. It really only has two, perhaps, because one has no variance or two are perfectly correlated, something along those lines. And we'll see in a, a visual of this in just a moment. We can think of that determinant as being like the volume of the matrix. And again, we can visualize this in a moment to get a sense of what, what the heck does that mean. So here we're going to work in two-dimensional space. The volume then becomes an area, right? We've got two dimensions, so two variables that define our covariance matrix S, right? So here's the variance of variable one, here's the variance of variable two, and then here's the covariance, 0.26. And of course, a covariance matrix is symmetric. Now for this covariance matrix, the determinant is 0.26. Seven two, all right. So this should this should be a two, Patrick. Sorry. Um, all right. So point seven two, and that represents the area defined by the kind of parallelogram given by these two column vectors. All right. So we can pull off the columns. We've got point eight three, point two six, and that defines a vector right here. Point eight three. 0.26, right? And then we can pull off the next column. I'm going to change colors just to get fancy right there. And that's going to define another vector right here, right? So we got those two vectors. And then if we kind of trace that out to look like a parallelogram, kind of like we did with that addition rule, right? We're just going to take those and add them together, right? Then the area inside this box Right, so this area right here is your determinant. All right, isn't that cool? 
right? That's what the determinant is showing you. Now, why is that interesting? Well, imagine if these two variables got more highly correlated, right? If they get more highly correlated, the angle between these two variables is going to get smaller and smaller, right? These arrows, the angle between them is going to get tighter, right? And you're going to have less and less area because these two variables are more highly correlated, right? So you can think of this as capturing like how much overall variance is there. If these two variables are perfectly correlated, the vectors are going to lie on top of one another and the area is going to go to zero. And that's going to tell us that we really don't have two separate variables. We really just have one variable because the two are correlated 1.0. And as Patrick was saying earlier when he was stealing my thunder quite rudely, is that that angle between your two vectors, if you take the cosine of that anger, angle, it is literally the correlation between your two vectors, right? Is it reflects that correlation between the two vectors? Sorry, I know I said anger. It was a I, the, that, <laughs> the I, cosine of that <clears throat> anger. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. I, I know. If you'll Sorry. excuse me, I'm going to go back to sleep. No, I, I was actually, I was only angry at the typo. It had nothing to do with you. Dude, like, how did that slip through? Oh my God. We review this. We we'll exchange. We'll fix it in the PDF. Oh, we'll say. We exchange this like 10 times. Yeah. Uh, in, in fairness, uh, yeah. We, all, we only exchanged a two decimal version like once. At one uh, point, this was out to like five decimal points. And I'll take the blame for this because I was like, I don't think we need five decimal points. Right. So it's like, let's just take it down to two. It'll be easier to look at. If see my, could, see, that's nice yeah. pedagogy if you if get you the numbers right. you talk a little bit quieter, I'm trying to. Are you trying to sleep? I'm, I'm sorry. Sleep. I'll see if I can get you back there. It shouldn't take long. All right. So I gave you a simple example of when the determinant might go to zero is if, if you have two vectors and they lie exactly on top of each other. So two variables that are perfectly correlated. They're going to lie right on top of each other and that area is going to go to zero. But imagine that can happen in a more complicated way too, is let's say we have this data matrix here, X, right? And then this is our covariance matrix based on that data matrix, if we take the determinant of this covariance matrix, it's going to be zero, right? And the reason it's zero is because one of the columns is a linear function, a deterministic linear function of the others, right? And we can see that is if we take this column, it is equal to our first column, x1, our first variable, plus two times the second. Right, so one plus four is five, four plus two is six, four plus zero is four. So X3 is really not an independent data vector, right? It's not really an independent variable. It is completely collinear with the other two variables, right? And so if we take the determinant of this S covariance matrix, it will be zero because the vectors really do lie on top of each other in this case. Now, why is this important? Because you will often get error messages about a determinant that either gets near zero, right, or even goes to zero. A lot of times if it goes all the way to zero, your model's going to fail to converge completely. But if a determinant gets close to zero, then it means the variance is getting really, really, really tiny, and that can create problems, right? I Patrick. just, I want to give you an attaboy, mm -hmm. because I added that last bullet late last night, and I may not have told you about it. And mm -hmm. I was pretty impressed how you just were like, and a really important thing when you actually had not seen that yeah. before. It's, it's super, super important. <laughs> but imagine you're doing, say, a factor analysis, all right? And you have a set of items. And one of the problems in trying to thread a needle in factor analysis is you want to have a set of items that all share the tapping into some underlying construct, say, depressive symptomatology. And you want to have 10 items that that tap into depressive symptomatology, but you don't want them to be so related that you have a near 1.0 correlation 
between your items that forbids you from proceeding with the analysis in the way that we're talking about. So, for example, two very important items in depressive symptomatology is I often feel lonely. But then there's a companion item is I often feel lonely even when I'm around other people. Well, those are two really important items because one is a general loneliness, but one is a loneliness even when you're with other people. But those two may be interpreted by the individual as lonely and lonely, and you might have a correlation of 0.9 or 0.92. It doesn't give you a determinant of zero, but it gives you one that's awful close, and the models don't like awful close. Yeah. Yeah. That's a nice example. Um I can't believe I said that, but it is. It really I was going to say you, uh, you at least you didn't use the word kind. actually. Yeah, it's actually a nice example. Um, uh, if I may, I'll offer a second context, uh, just as kind of general, showing how these things can be useful in a variety of ways. Is in a in a finite mixture model, like what we're trying to do in a finite mixture model is identify if there are different groups in our data, right? And so you can imagine maybe we have some groups, and these are just data values on two variables. So we have an X and a Y variable, and we have one group that's kind of here, and we have another group that's maybe, you know, here, right? And what we want to do in our model is identify these two groups. So we would, we would kind of like to have a model where we, we have one, oh, I should have done that. What did did I do? Let me try again. Give me a second. I'm, I'm on the fly, right? So we want one group here. Okay, I gotta go back to blue. And this we is want why another we should group. not do these on we Friday. We should not do afternoon. this kind of thing. Right. So we want another group there. And that would be all fine and good. But what if in, in this particular group there are just a few observations that are really close together on a what line? What the hell are those? Those are obs- those are X's. No, they're, they're just more observations of- in green. Jeez. Right. What can happen is your model, because those observations just by chance happen to be really close together, it will fit a little group here instead, right? So you'll have a group there and then you'll just have a big group that's everybody else. And the way you can detect that it's going off the rails and doing this is by looking at the determinant. And if the determinant for a group is really tiny, right? We would get a really small determinant for this group right here because they're all falling on that line, right? The vectors are really highly correlated. Then we would say, oh, I think there's something funny going on here. I don't think that's really a group. I think that might just be, you know, by chance, a few observations were really close. So we can inspect things like determinants to see whether or not that sort of thing is happening. And what's super important about this particular example is Dan's need to have the last word because you mm-hmm. know i had the items and uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna, yeah, just, I'm gonna go it now. was my turn <laughs> it's my turn <laughs> my kids used to say my spot right as you'd like you'd want to get on the couch and and your kid be like my spot in my spot and they just like shove you off um Dude, back to it. Back, back, what, wait, back where? To what are we talking about? I don't know. Just keep going. All right, it's a non sequitur, anyway, so it's all good. Next <laughs> this operation. This entire thing is a non sequitur. <laughs> like one thing to the next. All right, so the next operation that we're going to talk about is the trace operation, which you will also occasionally see. Um, so the trace operation is a nice, simple one. It's also only applicable to square matrices. And what it is, is you just take all the diagonal elements off that matrix and you add them together, right? So if you have matrix A and it's P by P, it's a square matrix. We're just going to go across those diagonal positions and we're going to pull off all the values and add them up. So we take A11, A22, A33, and so on, and we just add them up. And where you will often see this applied is to a covariance matrix, right? As Patrick talked about, again, kind of stealing my thunder, is on the diagonal of the covariance matrix are the variances of each of the variables, right? Well, what happens if we take the trace of that covariance matrix is we're just going to add up the variances, right? And we're going to see what is the total variance across the set of variables in this covariance matrix. So the trace is another operation that you'll occasionally see. Unfortunately, it's a really easy thing to calculate. 
All right, so again, just as a way of sort of showing how these things work is we can think about how we compute the covariance matrix in terms of matrix algebra. Is imagine we have a data matrix X and it has P variables. And the cool thing about matrix algebra is you can just be like, well, what is P? And it doesn't matter, P could be anything. Right? It could be four variables, it could be 40 variables, it doesn't matter. So we have a data matrix X that has P variables. And just to make things a little bit simpler in terms of the computations, we're going to assume that these variables are mean centered. Right? So we take the original variable scores, we subtract their means, the means are all zero now. All right, well, we can calculate our sample covariance matrix. Remember, we, I said earlier, x prime x, you get sums of squares and cross products. Well, there it sits, x prime x, right in the numerator. And that's going to give us those sums of squares and cross products of the mean deviated values. And then we divide by n minus 1, right, scalar multiplication. And there sits our covariance matrix, right? So that's pretty darn cool, right? This thing on top is sometimes referred to as the corrected sums of squares and cross products matrix, corrected in the sense that it's using the mean centered data. If you didn't center the data, it would be an uncorrected sums of squares and cross products. To get the covariance matrix, you want to use that corrected one and divide by n minus one, right? So just a very simple matrix operation will work no matter how many rows are in X, right? How many observations are in your sample, and no matter how many variables are in X, right? However many columns you might have variables of interest, right? All right, now we get into some, some wacky stuff, all right? So eigenvalues and eigenvectors, right? These are a little bit challenging to get your head around. So we're gonna do our best to give you kind of a sense of what eigenvalues and eigenvectors are all about. Eigenvalue vector decompositions are very common in multivariate statistical models. And so it's a good idea to kind of get your head around what these things are trying to do. So when we take eigenvalues and eigenvectors, what we're doing is we're repackaging a correlation or covariance matrix, or even sometimes a distance matrix into a set of composite variables that are orthogonal to one another, right? They are independent and orthogonal to one another. All right, the difference between eigenvalue and eigenvector is an eigenvalue reflects the variance of the composite and the eigenvector gives you the weights that you would apply to the original variables to form that composite. You have as many eigenvalues as there are measured variables. And if you take them all, right, you get every possible eigenvalue and every possible eigenvector, then you're really just re-expressing your data into a set of orthogonal dimensions, right? So your original variables are all correlated with one another. And you say, well, how could I obtain a set of, of variables that are not correlated with one another? Well, I can take these linear composites of the original variables and get these new composites that are often referred to as principal components in the context of a covariance or correlation matrix. But I can get this new composite variable that's uncorrelated with all the other Composite. So we're really just repackaging that original matrix by taking eigenvalues and eigenvectors. But oftentimes we will use a subset of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So if you think of what principal components analysis is, is you're taking a set of variables, you're trying to identify the primary directions of variation in there, right? What are the big eigenvalues that are running through this set of variables? Maybe I I take, I've got maybe 10 variables, but I only take the first two principal components. I'm trying to account for as much variance in that original 10 as I can with these two, right? So sometimes we'll use this for data reduction purposes. Oh boy, Patrick's camera's back on. Sometimes we'll use this for data reduction purposes where we won't actually use all of the possible eigenvalues and eigenvectors. We will just use the first few. This is true in principal components analysis, where you'll often take fewer components than the variables that you're analyzing. It's also used in multidimensional scaling so that you can take things that are in many dimensions and compress them into a two or three dimensional space for visualization purposes. Um, and Patrick has some pithy thing he wants to add. So <laughs> go ahead, buddy. I, I would if I knew what the word pithy meant. I'm guessing. Did I say pithy? Some... I meant yeah, pissy. Is that there? It's Thank pissy. you. All right. 
is no i don't want to belabor it because i know we're getting long here but this stuff is so important you know what helped me get my head around when i learned this the first time is this is not some weirdo thing that you're never going to need to know like eigenvalues and eigenvectors are insanely important and you can think about any multivariate statistical method as being a method of data reduction. We're trying to take a larger amount of information and distill it down to a smaller amount of information. There are all sorts of motivations why we may want to do that, theoretically, philosophically, just pragmatically. But whatever it is, is, is go back to Dan's 10 items. He said you have 10 items, all right? Now think about what a mean is, all right? Dan talked about that with the, the plate. It was a weird plate, I got to tell you, Bauer, but it was a, a plate. So folks, I have no idea when you're watching this. It's late on Friday afternoon for us, so we're kind of, things are coming off the rails just all by itself. But whatever the weirdo triangular plate that Dan uses at his house is, that's that center, right? Is that sometimes we can think about as an unweighted composite, right? If you think about what is a mean of 10 items, it's one of item one plus one of item two plus one of item three. You add them up, there's only one mean, right? They're, because they're all, they're sometimes called unit weighted. All right, well, here at Carolina, and are you ready for this? 1932, all right, 90 years ago, a guy named Harold Hotelling said, hey, I got an idea. What if instead of just unit weighting everything and getting one mean, that we use a set of weights to get our first composite, which Dan described as that component, that principal component, and maybe instead of just one of the first item and one of the second item, maybe we have 0.9 times the first item plus 0.8 times the second item, 0 0.7, 0 0.9, 0 0.8, but 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 for the last ones, and we get that first composite. Well, it differentially weights those items, all right? Now, he, Hotel Lane leaned back and said, well, that's kind of cool, but I can get another composite where I use different weights. And maybe the next one has 0.1s and 0.2 on the first five items and 0.8s and 0.9s on the second. Well, the variance of that first composite is the eigenvalue, and the weights to get it are the eigenvectors. So I just think it's kind of neat in comparing it to how we compute a mean versus how we compute these composites. And as Dan has already talked about, if we have 10 items, we can make 10 composites, but nobody cares. Right, because now we started with a 10 by 10 correlation matrix and now we got a 10 by 10 correlation matrix. Well done, all you did was just re-express it. But the goal in all of multivariate stats is to have some value less than the number of variables. And then it becomes a kid's game of how close is close enough, right? So is two enough? Is three enough? Is four enough? And that's where we get into factor analysis and principal components analysis. So I don't know. I just wanted to tie it to the unweighted mean, but also don't think about this as some weirdo thing you're never going to encounter. Actually, we can use eigenvalues and eigenvectors in almost every multivariate application we encounter. Yeah, they, they are used a lot in lots of different approaches. So in principal components analysis and factor analysis and network analysis. There's eigenvector centrality and multidimensional scaling. You're trying to compress into a lower number of dimensions for visualization purposes. There, there are just a lot of different situations where, you know, it is, you've got a 10 dimensional problem, right? A 10 dimensional space with 10 items and that's hard to work with. But if you can compress it with a minimal loss of information into a smaller number of dimensions, that has a lot of value, um, both from a data reduction point of view, but also just in helping us understand our data. Um, exactly. And so think about a 10 by 10 correlation matrix. Here's a parlor trick for you. All right, is your back swirling wine? I don't drink wine. I don't think you drink wine, Dan. I don't know, but Not some really. reason I, I I think people swirl it. I don't know why. Maybe I saw it in a movie once. But, you know, you're swirling wine and you say, well, how many bivariate correlations are there in a 10 by 10 correlation matrix? So you have 10 variables. There's correlation one with two, one with three, one with four. How many unique ones are there? 
Well, it's P times P minus one divided by two. That counts how many correlations there are in a matrix. So 10 times nine is 90 divided by two. There are 45 bivariate correlations in a 10 by 10 matrix. We can't make sense of 45 bivariate correlations, but if we can approximate that with a three by three correlation matrix, which is three times two divided by two is now we have three correlations, one with two, one with three, and two with three, that data reduction helps us understand the dimensionality of it. So that's exactly right. And we're getting really long, so I'm going to quit talking. Go on to the next slide. All temporarily, right. So, temporarily. Temporarily. Uh, you'll do be not back concede. soon. Yeah, my spot. My spot. Yeah, to take my uh, overly dense and hard to understand comments, and try to make them a little more approachable. Um, all right. So the last bullet on the last slide, which I skipped, was that these things have kind of magical properties almost is they really okay so admittedly this slide's title might be a little misleading because i'm not sure there's anything really truly cool about eigenvalues and eigenvectors hey but, i wrote that slide title uh yeah i mean you can see why we have this is why you conflict. and i are the only friends we have that's right that's right um all right so some cool things kind of cool things about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. All right, so we're going to think about a correlation or a covariance matrix where these are very commonly used. Is there are as many eigenvalues as there are observed variables? Although, as Patrick mentioned, if you really took them all, what are you really doing? You're just re-expressing things. And so that's maybe not as useful from a data reduction standpoint as taking a smaller number of these components. But there are as many eigenvalues as there are observed variables. And if we added them up, we summed the eigenvalues. Remember what that trace was? They're going to equal the trace of the matrix. So all that variance is still there, right? We're neither destroying nor creating new variance. We are just re-expressing that variance. So in the case of a correlation matrix, the sum of the eigenvalues is always going to be the number of variables because each diagonal element on that correlation matrix is a one, right? Here's another cool thing. If you multiply the eigenvalues together, you get the determinant of the matrix. Remember that determinant tells you the generalized variance in the matrix? Well, that's the product of these eigenvalues. Each eigenvalue is capturing a piece of variance in this overall system of variables, right? And you multiply them all together and you get the determinant, the overall generalized variance. And then the last thing here that's kind of interesting, we haven't yet talked about the rank of a matrix, but the number of non-zero values, non-zero eigenvalues is the rank of a matrix. If any of these eigenvalues go to zero, then that means that one of these variables in your correlation matrix is redundant with all the others and your matrix is not of full rank. You might have a 10 by 10 correlation matrix, but one of these variables is actually superfluous. It's just a, a linear combination of the others. And so you've, you've represented it as 10 by 10, but really there's only a rank of say nine, right? Because one of those variables is redundant. So that's kind of, you know, those are some kind of fun little, you know, if you ever want to play a trivia game with your buddies while you're out at the pub, right? Well, let's do trivia about eigenvalues. Yeah, no, nobody thinks that's cool. I'm sorry, Patrick. It's, it's just not. Um, so we've talked a little bit about this, but just to kind of get our heads around interpretation a little bit, is what do these eigenvalues and eigenvectors represent? Well, an eigenvector is going to capture sort of a direction of maximum variation in your data. And the eigenvalue is going to represent how big is that, right? So one is direction, the other is magnitude. So the eigenvector tells you the direction of variation. The eigenvalue tells you the amount. The first eigen, so this is kind of a, like a greedy thing. The first eigenvalue and eigenvector are going to take as much variance as they can out of this set of variables, right? So you've got this big correlation matrix and the first one's gonna take as much as it can of that variation, right? And then the second eigenvalue and eigenvector have to take from what's left, right? So they're gonna take in a direction that is orthogonal to the first eigenvector, they're gonna, it's gonna take that next most direction of maximum variation. And then the third will come along and take whatever's left over, and the fourth will come along and it gets the table scraps, right? Whatever remains. So each eigenvector represents a direction of variation that is orthogonal to all other 
eigenvectors, all other directions of variation, and the eigenvalues are their variances. Right now, this is often obtained through a procedure referred to as a spectral decomposition, right, which sounds kind of spooky. It's not really. Um, in the context of a, a covariance matrix or correlation matrix, this is what gives rise to our principal components analysis, right, is we can obtain those eigenvalues and eigenvectors for principal components using a spectral decomposition. All right, so that was all very abstract. We're going to try to visualize it here. All right, so here we're going to look at it in the context of a two by two covariance matrix. So we have two variables. We have an x, and we have a y, right? So here's our x variable, here's our y value, our y variable, and we've just done a little scatter plot of these two variables, all right? So all the little dots represent the x, y coordinates for our observations in our data set. Now, we've drawn an ellipse around this, right? So this little ellipse here kind of encloses the observations on x and y and represents the multivariate distribution. And you can see there's a negative correlation between x and y. All right, is that higher values of x tend to be paired with a little bit lower values of y. So in the original x and y variables, these are correlated with one another. Now we look at this and we say, well, what is the direction of maximum variation? Well, you know, I'm tempted to say, well, let's go here to here, right? That's where we see the most variation, right, is in that direction on this ellipse. And that red dashed line, that's going to capture that first principal component. Right? And then we say, well, what's left over? Well, there's, there's still variation, but now it's in this dimension. Right? So we've kind of captured things in this direction, right, where there was maximal variation, but we still have this direction to think about, right? And that's going to be our second principal component. And so the, the red line is our first principal component, and the blue line indicates the second most direction of maximal variation. That's going to be our second eigenvector and eigenvalue. It's going to capture that blue dimension of variation. And notice that the blue and the red lines they are at right angles to one another, right? And that's that orthogonality, right? The blue line captures the direction of maximal variation that is orthogonal to the first, the red line, right? And so what we're doing is we're taking that correlated X and Y, and we are re-expressing them in terms of these two principal components that represent orthogonal directions of variation, the red component and the blue component. And again, you know, if we take as many components as we have variables, we're really just repackaging things. But often we will do some kind of data reduction too, where we'll say, well, you know, the first three or four principal components capture most of the variation that we see among our set of maybe 10 items. And so we're going to leave things at that and we'll just ignore the remaining principal components, the, the small eigenvalue, eigenvector combinations that represent directions of variation that just aren't all that big among the set of variables in our analysis. All right, so that was for a covariance matrix. Similar interpretations would hold for a correlation matrix, but you'll see, you know, this applied eigenvalue, eigenvector decompositions are applied to other kinds of matrices as well. Sometimes they are applied to matrices of distances, right? So how close in space are observations to one another. That's done sometimes in multidimensional scaling. It's done in cluster analysis. And in this case, that first eigenvector is going to capture the, the dimension of maximal variation in space, right? In distance, right? And the second would be the next most, and the third would be the next most, and so on. Sometimes this is also used with adjacency metrics matrices, for instance, in network analysis. So if you're familiar with the, the concept of eigenvector centrality for identifying the centrality of nodes in a network, we use eigenvalues and eigenvectors with adjacency matrices to get a sense of this. And again, it's very common with correlation matrices 
uh, in exploratory factor analysis to get at components and factors and the the eigenvectors and factor loadings that go along with those. We won't get into here that principal components analysis and factor analysis are somewhat different things that can have common purposes but are motivated somewhat differently. We'll let Greg and Patrick talk about that in their measurement class. Um, but both principal components analysis and factor analysis rely on this idea of using eigenvalues and eigenvectors to represent factors, components, and factor loadings, right? How do those items come together to reflect that underlying factor? All right, so we've reached the end here, our summary. We don't have to be experts, right? So it's not important that you have an intimate knowledge of matrix algebra. It is not critical for you to be able to invert a matrix by hand using the method of cofactors. You do not have to calculate eigenvalues and eigenvectors by hand, but it's good to have just some basic familiarity with these things, right? Just have a basic sense of what they're all about. And I like to give the analogy of like, I am not that mechanically inclined, right? I'm, I'm not that good with cars. And so if I take my car into the shop and the technician says, oh, your axle boot is cracked. I'm going to say that sounds bad, right? I, yeah, replace the axle boot. How much is that? $2,000. Well, I don't want my axle falling off. I probably need a boot on there. Go ahead and fix it, right? But I, is an axle boot even a thing? I don't know. I have no real knowledge of this. So the technician could be just straight up lying to me. I think axle boots are a thing. Patrick, you may know. But if I had even just a basic knowledge of automotive mechanics, I would be much better off in speaking to the technician, right? So we don't expect you to develop software. We don't expect you to be an expert in these things. We don't expect you to write mathematical proofs. We just want you to have enough familiarity that when you do see expressions of things in matrix algebra, it's not, not intimidating. You don't just sort of check out and say, oh, I'm going to leave it to the experts. You have at least some understanding of what the matrix algebra represents so that you can kind of follow along what's going on here. And as we saw, right, a matrix is nothing more than a doubly ordered organizational structure for numbers, right? There's no magic there, right? Is, there's, there's nothing magical about them. They're just an organizational structure that allows us to express models in a complex, compact kind of way, right? Matrix algebra is just a set of rules, right? Is we learn how to do addition and subtraction and multiplication and division for scalars, right? For arithmetic, well, we can do the same kinds of things with matrices. Right, for the most part, we can't divide a matrix by another matrix, but we can rely on the idea of an inverse to do similar kinds of things. Right, so we just have to learn the rules. Addition and subtraction are pretty easy. Scalar multiplication is pretty easy. Matrix multiplication is a little bit more complicated. And there are some things that are new in matrix algebra the transpose, the trace, the determinant, eigenvalues, and eigenvectors. Right, these are some new things that are, are just new rules that we have to think about. All right, so we're going to see matrices in many of the different classes that you might take with CenterStat, in many textbooks, in many manuscripts, in many software programs. They are used quite prevalently throughout multivariate statistics, so it's just good to have some basic knowledge of how these work. Now, sometimes these things are kind of under the hood. They're not always as, as um, overtly shown in a manuscript or in a software program, but they're always operating underneath there, right? So like, for instance, the M plus program that we use for structural equation modeling, sometimes you write it out in almost sentence-like structure, but there's a parser that goes behind your syntax and fills in these matrices and runs the model in a matrix algebra way. Um, so it may be happening under the hood, but in other programs, you might actually input the matrices directly, right? And in the manuscripts and the textbooks, the matrices are going to be shown for the SEM as well. So just good to have some basic familiarity with these. Patrick, your camera is on, so I take that to mean that I have reached the end of my time. You have, and I woke up and I figured, Jesus, he's still going? It's like summary. Oh, I, boy. <laughs> Where but was I more importantly is I can replace your axle boot for half that price. But while I'm in there doing the work is it makes a lot of sense to replace the wiffle wobbler as well. 
And oh, that's going to that be another fourteen hundred dollars. No, okay, it'll be so. I'll do the axle boot for a grand, but the wiffle wobbler is going to be fourteen hundred. Um, wiffle really wobbler doesn't sound a thousand dollar worth. Like if you we'll told talk. me it was the you know axle inverter, I'd be like, <laughs> because you want to invert important. your axle. Well, sometimes you want the rear to go to the front, and the front I to go guess. to the rear, don't you? I yes, I'm confused. Clearly. Um, but. Way long ago is when we were opening this whole conversation. And first, thank you for your patience and going through with us, as we hope we, you've found this of some use, is I gave that example of the error that is actually very common. It's not a weirdo thing you might encounter once in your life. It's very common. Psi matrix, not positive, definite, can't be inverted. We hope we've just given you some sense of nomenclature of what that means. So the psi matrix is, it turns out, the matrix of your latent factors. So if you're doing a CFA or an SEM or a growth model, psi matrix is that latent uh, uh, factor covariance matrix. It can't be inverted because it has a near zero determinacy. Well, the determinacy is the generalized variance of the matrix. The only way you can get a zero or near zero is if you have a linear dependency among your columns or a no near zero variance. You know what the matrix is. You know what the issue is. You know at least what the problem is. And you got to fix it. That's not one that you can ignore. So we hope you found this of some use is, you know, whether it be more things that you take from us or if you go somewhere else or just in your own reading is, uh, you know, this is the underpinning really of everything that you do, whether it be regression or factor analysis or SEM or anything is this is the foundation. And it's Friday afternoon and Bauer, I am done. I'm ready for my glass of wine. Oh, wait. No. Are you? Oh, I'm not a wine I guy. Say... Whiskey and cigars. <laughs> That's what I need. I have been to your house and you are not a whiskey and cigar kind of. You wouldn't, your wife would not allow that. No. Nah. No. But a nice German beer with some cold sausage and cheese, I can yeah. get over there in 20 minutes. A half of Eisen is on the way. <laughs> <laughs> hey, take care, everybody. Thank you so much for your time. All right. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye.